Uh, with that, uh, Professor Field, if you'd like yeah. to start. Well, I know at least one person in this room who would like to have a siesta now. That's myself. <laughs> um, but, you know, Congress is being what they are. I'll move on to my paper. To honor a globally acknowledged scholar, Mohammed Akun standing, it is tempting to take a cue from one of his major and most recent studies, the unthought in contemporary Islamic thought. And I admit freely that I succumbed to this temptation. One of the most important, or at least most, chap most interesting chapters to me of this book deals with authority and power in Islamic thought. <clears throat> and my paper is, on the one hand, an attempt to analyze one aspect of the power structure inherent in interreligious polemics. After a few general remarks, I will deal in part one with Christian and Muslim discourses of superiority. And I will compare the role of reason in and for religion, as seen by Pope Benedict XVI, to the Egyptian reformist Mohammed Abdo, on, which, on whom we will have a paper immediately after my presentation, <laughs> in the 19th century. <coughs> in the second part of my paper, I will attempt to point to what I think are subtle, but still significant <coughs> changes of attitude in interreligious dialogues between Muslims and Christians in modern times. Here we find, I think, interesting inklings of transcending the discourse of superiority and an attempt to overcome what has been called, in a debated and debatable term, exclusivism. How does the introduction of the religious other into theological discourse affect the construction of belief? There are not too many theologians, intellectual scholars on both sides of the Christian-Muslim divide who deal with these questions. And I, it has to be admitted that the ideas and proposal, proposals that I will discuss may interest only a small minority of believers. Nevertheless, the theology of the religious other in a globalized, multicultural, and multi-religious world is a fairly new concept and may offer a chance to overcome the worn out discourses of superiority. So let me start with part one, Pope Benedict and Mohammed Abdul. Christianity and Islam claim to have a privileged accent, access, if not an exclusive access, to transcendental truth. Without this claim, and without the concomitant claim that this truth is of crucial importance for the well-being of the individual and of his or her community in this world and in the hereafter, these religions would lose their meaning. Religious belief, as seen from the inside, is therefore, to some extent, irreducible and beyond comparative evaluation. Um, these religions are exclusivist. In multi-religious societies, however, no religion can enforce what it considers a superior claim to truth. On the other hand, globalization spread religions across the globe, so the multi-religious factor in many societies will most probably become more important. The staunchest atheist will have to live next to the most pious religious literalist, be she or he Christian or Muslim, a Buddhist or a Hindu. And an often overlooked aspect of religious reality is that the average individual did not and does not choose a religion, but was and is born into a religion. History and geography are in this respect often as important or even more important as theological doctrine or individual choice. Early and medieval Muslim societies enjoyed a living experience of pluralism, or plurality, which was much stronger than that in parallel Christian societies, 
Under Muslim rule, several communities, Jews, Christians, or Rastians, could exist side by side, at least in principle. They did have scriptures in different languages, which contained nevertheless similar messages. On, on the other hand, under medieval Christian rule, the fact that Jewish scripture was also part of Christian scripture did usually nothing to alleviate the mostly deplorable reality of Jewish life under Christian rule. The interreligious competition, whose religion is true, has marked religious and social life through the ages wherever different religions came into contact. Christianity and Islam are until today caught up in such discourses of superiority and are linked or maybe even trapped in this competition. It shows itself in missionary activities in Christian Tabshir, Muslim Dawah. Both sides, true to their universalist claims, agree that giving up Tabshir or giving up Dawah would betray their most cherished values. I know that there are important exceptions and notable new approach, uh, approaches on both sides, but for, for mainstream theology, mission as tafsir or, or da'wah as a principle is not negotiable. The missionary competition between Muslims and Christians in Africa, parts of Africa, is very much alive, and in Europe, where conversions between Islam and Christianity are a growing phenomenon, the competition is widely seen as an unsolved religious problem and may to a certain extent also become a legal problem. In the course of history, blood has been shed by adherents of these two religions in order to prove their point, less by the Muslim side, more on the Christian side. One cannot overlook the fact, of course, that just as much blood has been shed within Christianity and also, maybe to a lesser extent, within Islam to make religious truth prevail and make heresy or error disappear. And one should, of course, not forget that anti-religious movements produce no fewer victims among the religious as well. That's not our topic. In Central Europe, the concept of the freedom of religion, including the right to change one's religion and to profess no religion at all, has been, by and large, I think, successfully implemented, even where there is a Christian religion of state. My impression is that in countries dominated by a Muslim majority, the issue of this type of full religious freedom is often either seen as marginal or as artificial. Muslims in diaspora, however, disagree. The most important Muslim organizations in Germany, for instance, accept the principle of full freedom of religion without reservation. Religious truth in Christianity and Islam is in any case tied up with the idea, inextricably, that there is only one true religion and that all other religions are in some sense wrong. Um, not talking on a sophisticated level of theology, uh, I think many people would say, my kids don't eat what your kids eat. My kids should not marry your kids. When I die, I'm going, hopefully, to enter paradise. You will go to hell. This is not sophisticated at all, but I think it's a prevalent paradigm with many in Muslims and Christian uh, circles. Um, this situation is not mitigated by the fact that neither in the eyes of the Christians nor in the eyes of the Muslims the other religion is completely false. But in spite of large areas of overlapping, Christianity and Islam encapsulate a strong antithesis between false and true religion. Many Christians still fear Islam, many Muslims still fear Christianity. And my thesis is that in modern religious discourse and in its construction of belief, the opposition between a completely true and an only partially false religion is gradually replaced by the opposition between a superior religion and an inferior religion. 
thereby hegemonic aspect is introduced which tends to be superimposed on the aspect of truth. Muhammad Akun has already pointed out in what way what he called an Islamic reason and a Western secularized reason oppose each other and he argued for an anti-hegemonic critique of both. Um, Islam is feared in many parts of Europe because it contests the hegemony of the Christian churches and or of secularism. Christianity and secularism are feared in many parts of the Muslim world because they are seen as hegemonic doctrines. It is therefore often not so much the truth of competing religions which is at stake today but their power. Numerous Muslim scholars consider a powerful Islam as inextricably linked to an Islamic state. They act as though even the fundamental rituals of religion are not practices Muslims must undertake because they are an irreducible part of being a believer, but rather because they are socially useful in inculcating the habits and the discipline that assist in the project of striving for an Islamic state. On the other hand, a diaspora situation leads many Muslims to silently or openly give up the idea of a universal Islamic state or at least to modify it. And I want now to exemplify what I call the discourse of superiority with a comparison which may sound far-fetched but I think is illuminating, that of Muhammad Abdo, the most famous Muslim reformist of the 19th century, and Pope Benedict XVI, and how both construct the role of reason in their uh, religions. Pope Benedict XVI, in his famous lecture in Regensburg of September 2006 on belief and reason, Glaube und Vernunft, discusses the role of reason in Islam. And he quotes, most of you will know what I'm now going to tell you, that he, he quotes religious discussion between the Byzantine Emperor Manuel II in the year 1391 with an educated Muslim probably or possibly a Persian. This dialogue all also deals with jihad and the Pope quotes Manuel with the words, I quote, show me what Muhammad taught as new and you will find only evil and inhumanity, <laughs> such as Muhammad's command to spread the faith which he preached by the sword. End of quote. Muslim armies at this time stood not far from Constantinople. And even if the Pope called this quote unacceptably gruff in form, end of quote, the damage was done. According to the Pope, Islam taught that religion should be spread by force. That is, according to the Pope, why the religion of Islam is not built on reason, whereas, and now I quote, not to act with the logos, the Greek word for reason, is incompatible with the essence of God, that the Pope's words. Equally provocative, the Pope links this position with the fact, I quote, that Christianity in spite of its origin and in spite of important developments in the Orient received its historically decisive imprint in Europe, end of quote. In Islam, and by the way, to a lesser extent also to, to Protestantism, of Protestantism, Pope Benedict tells us this amalgamation of revelation and Greek reason is weak or absent. So Pope Benedict compares Catholic Christianity to Islam and partially to Protestantism and few people were surprised when he found Catholic Christianity to be superior. The question of how revealed religion relates to human reason is of course one of the oldest questions of philosophy and theology in both cultures. But the kind of comparison that the Pope uses has a long polemical background on both sides. Now we find analogous statements in the comparative mode in many modern Muslim treatises dealing with Islam. Of course, invariably in favor of Islam. Islam in this view is superior to all other religions and in particular superior to Christianity. And the main factor is that Islam is the most reasonable of all religions and that it is in particular more reasonable than Christianity. And this is 
becomes very manifest in Mohammed Abdus uh, apologetic polemic against Christianity. Al-Islam wa Nasraniya ma'al ilm wal madaniya, Islam and Christianity in relations to science and culture. Um, this was directed in the first place against Farah Antun, the Greek Orthodox Christian, who had espoused Ernest Renan's idea that Islam as such was inimical to science and reason. Renan had based his view on what one would today call, without question, a mainly racist paradigm of history. Muhammad Abdo and after him numerous Muslim scholars rose to defend Islam. Many of them claimed and claim that the tension between reason and belief so often invoked in different Christian theologies simply does not exist in Islam. And the argument was inversed. Christianity, according to Muhammad Abdo, rests on the belief in the irrational, al-Iman bi al al-Maqul. Um, Muhammad Abdo did admit a possible divergence of religion and reason, but any potential conflict was, according to him, easily resolved. The adherence to the Islamic faith, except for a negligible few, agree that if reason and religious tradition conflict, one should follow reason. So according to a majority of Muslim scholars at the time, I think until today, the central tenets of Islam are more reasonable than those of Christianity. For Muhammad Abdu, reason was embodied in the first place in natural sciences. But reason had also to reign in metaphysics. The unity of God is a more reasonable proposition than the dogma of Trinity. And the dogma that God's son died on the cross defies human reason. So we find that Pope Benedict XVI and Muhammad Abdo, more than 100 years apart, take contradictory but completely symmetrical positions, even if their concepts of what reason really meant were very different. But each found his own religion superior because it could be shown to be more reasonable. In both cases, of course, the addressee is not the religious other. When Muhammad Abdo, the Mufti of Egypt, wrote his, his treatise, there were probably very, very few non-Muslims who could read him. Mohammed Abdu's message didn't address the European public. His implied recipient was the enlightened Muslim intellectual inside and outside Egypt who knew Arabic. And this type of discourse is always, in the first place, self-assertive. It addresses the community of the co-believers. It is designed to strengthen their belief and their cohesion. And this is, in my opinion, basically also true for Pope Benedict's lecture. However, in the latter case, more than a hundred years after Mohammed Abdo's death, globalism struck, and the more polemical parts of a lecture delivered in the provincial German town of Regensburg within hours reached a Muslim public worldwide. With the consequences we all know, the open letter to the Pope, signed by 38 Muslim scholars, and a second letter called A Common Word Between Us and You, signed by 138 Muslim scholars, directed not only to the Pope, but also to Orthodox patriarchs, archbishops, and metropolitans, to Protestant and Anglican bishops, and so forth. There are numerous other discursive devices to prove religious superiority. And let me only add one other instance. Religious superiority is often invoked by claiming to have a better that is to say, a superior idea of who or what God really is. This is often expressed in endless discussions, and here I think there are mostly Christians involved, whether Muslims, Christians, and Jews believe in the same God or not. Post-Holocaust Christian theology in Europe was eager to emphasize the dependence of Christianity on Judaism, the relative autarky of Jewish religion, and the pri privileged closeness of Christianity to Judaism. And in this way, Felix Körner, a man who has spent years in Ankara and has written a very good book on Turkish exegesis of the Quran, um, argued that whereas Christians and Muslims cannot be said to believe in the same God, it is appropriate to say that Christian and Jews do believe in the same God. The aspect of superiority is here, I think, clearly visible. Jews and Christians have the better, the truer image of God, 
which they share and which Islam prevents Muslims to attain. The question of superiority also crops up when in translations of the Quran from Arabic the que into German, for instance, the question arises whether the Arabic word Allah should be retained in the translation or whether it should be translated by the word for God commonly used in the target language. And there is a strange dialectic here. Muslim translators often assert that only the Arabic word Allah conveys the full range of the Muslim concept of divinity and therefore it should be retained even in an otherwise translated text. The word Allah is in some in some ways better than the word for God in any other language. Now, non-Muslim translators, on the other hand, may also leave the Arab word Allah in a non-Arabic context, but their motive may be completely different. They create an inter-religious distance which <coughs> infringes on the universal concept of divinity. And by leaving the Arabic word Allah in the translated text, they subtly imply that Allah is a mainly Arab God. Um, I move on to part two, um, which I've called Beyond Superiority and Beyond Exclusivism, the theological other. That's, of course, a, a, a theological term which I don't think would have been understood a hundred years ago. Theological other. It's a very modern word. Whereas in both religions there are and have always been strong currents to insist on the superior character of their own truths, an, an impossible plural in a way, in modern times, there are growing tendencies to assure the religious other of a, at least partial overlapping of truths and to stress this partial agreement. This also has a dialectic of its own. It is often admitted that the teachings of the other religion, the wrong one, are not completely false, especially if interpreted in the light of the tenet of the religion of the speaker. This works often in a retroactive way. Christianity could not but accept parts of Judaism. Islam could not but share some of the tenets, rules, and doctrines with Judaism and Christianity. But Christianity for a long time accepted Jewish scripture only if it was interpreted in a Christological way. In a similar way, many contemporary Muslim religious scholars judge the validity of Christian and Jewish scripture by the, measure, by the measure of their compatibility with Quran and Hadith. The official emphasis on a partial agreement usually serves a dialogical aim. And a good example is the Abrahamic tradition. This construction of an Abrahamic unity between Islam, Christianity, and Judaism is of course foreshadowed in the Quran by the Millat Ibrahim, the religion of, of, of Abraham, the concept of Ibrahim as a Hanif Muslim, and it had its legal consequences in the concept of the Zimma. And it was reinvented in a way mainly by Christians much later, and was, as far as I know, unfolded as a possible starting point for dialogue between Muslim, Christians, and Jews only in the 20th century. Names as, such as Louis Massignon, of course, come to mind. And the best-known modern proponent of this construction of an Abrahamic bond between the monotheist religions was possibly Pope John the, uh, uh, 23rd, with his famous Abrahamic statements in Vaticanum II. And there is a certain analogy with what in modern Muslim terminology are often called the heavenly religions, al adyana Samawiya, a term which stresses the similarities between these monotheist religions more than the differences. And I must confess that I do not know how old this term is and who used it first. A further element of constructing an interreligious monotheist bond was and is a very debatable point, the fight against the common enemy. This enemy was for a certain period in the first place militant communism. After the downfall of state-controlled socialism, the perceived ideological positions of the common enemy are mainly agnosticism, materialism, and atheism. To this, usually, and in the eyes of many, secularism has to be added. And in a time in which dialogue has become a byword for tolerance and peace, there are now specialized uh, learned journals from both sides of the religious divide which deal with nothing but questions of Muslim-Christian dialogue, and islamo Christiana, which is published in Rome, or the Bulletin of the Royal Institute for Interfaith Studies in Amman. The religious other, this 
strange new term, is on his way to become part of Christian and Muslim theology. Now, I, what I want to do, wanted to do now is to give you four examples. Um, now, I've already almost run out of time, so let me give you just... Mm, no, really not. You can... Uh is that right? Continue. I'll okay, good. Now I'll give I'll you four. four yeah, you, 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 you control me. <laughs> uh, first is the concept of Latin anima naturaliter Christiana, a naturally Christian soul which exists. On the one hand, Christian side, and the fitra, the mm. natural predisposition of uh, in, in Muslim theology. Uh, second, the concept of an anonymous Christian by Karl Rahner in Germany, a famous uh, uh, theologian, Jesuit, and the differentiation between Muslim and Mu'min in modernist tafsir. Third, the admission from the Christian side that Muhammad was a prophet. And last and not least, the concept of Muslims as an Ummah Wasat. Now, Church Father Tertullianus in the third uh, century our era has developed the doctrine of a naturally Christian soul. Anima naturalita Christiana. According to him, some pagans show by their behavior that deep in their heart they believe in God's unity, in the immortality of the soul, and the, in the existence of evil spirits. That was very important. They share, therefore, major Christian tenets. Their soul, as it were, is naturally Christian, independently of their professed religions. In the Middle Ages in Europe, some saw in the Roman pagan poet Virgilius an example of such a naturally Christian soul. And this concept has been taken much further in the 20th century by the concept of the anonymous Christian. I will come to that in a minute. Now I see a certain Islamic analogy to Tatulianus by nature naturally Christian soul in the concept of fitra. According to a very well-known hadith, every child is born according to the fitra, ala fitra. Then his parents make him a Jew or a Christian or a Magian. This is quoted for instance by Al-Ghazali in the Munqid, and I, he says, I saw that the Christian children grew up in Christianity and, and that the Jewish children grew up in Judaism and the Muslim children grew up in Islam. And I heard the tradition from the messenger of God, uh, uh, and then he goes on, and my innermost feeling reached out to try to find the truth of the original fitra. Now the text implies that every child is in a way a born Muslim, and it is only the environment, that's to the parents, who imbue it with a deviant belief. Now, I know that there are very long discussions on what fitra really means, but that is one of the accepted sort of interpretations of this. Uh, um, so I think there is a certain analogy here. Another, now I come to Karl Rahner's concept of the anonymous Christian. Karl Rahner, who died in 1984, uh, developed the, the theory that people who had never heard the gospel or even rejected it right away might still be saved through Christ. This concept became part of the declarations of the Second Vaticanum, which stated, I quote, those also can attain to everlasting salvation who through no fault of their own do not know the gospel of Christ of his church, yet sincerely seek God and moved by grace, strive by their deeds to do his will, God's will, and it is known to them through the dictates of conscience. Now this inclusivism is pr at present a very popular stance in interreligious positions, for instance in Germany. Non-Christians can have the salvific grace of God through Christ, although they may never heard of Christian revelation. Now this doctrine came under fire from two directions in the Catholic community. There was first a traditional Catholic view protesting that biblical Christianity is true and other religions are not. But some Catholic, group after, uh, some Catholic groups after the Second Vaticanum even separated from the Catholic Church. There was a schism, and one of the reasons was this very inclusivism. There was, on the other hand, the liberal voice, which found this idea paternalistic in the extreme. Hans Küng, known to most of you, I think, stated, I quote, it would be impossible to find anywhere in the world a sincere Jew, Muslim or atheist who would not regard the assertion that he is an anonymous Christian as presumptuous. 
and John Hicks, famous in the field, agreed with him by criticizing the same paternalistic notion of anonymous Christians because he said it is an honorary status granted unilat unilaterally to people who have not expressed any desire for it. Well, he has a point there. Now, I think very comparable is what Muhammad Shahroor in his book Al-Islam wal Iman, um, famous in the eyes of some Muslim authors, notorious in the eyes of others, developed. I think it's a very similar idea to Kalana's concept. He distinguishes between Islam and Iman, between Muslim and Mu'min. And his main thesis is that he vigorously contests the widely accepted approximate equation, the word Islam in the Quranic text more or less equals Iman. For Muhammad Shahrur, Islam designates only the universal religion of mankind in which Muslims, Christians, Jews, all religions of peoples of good faith are united. All mankind of goodwill is Muslim. So it's the exact symmetrical position with Kalana's position. Um, a human, um, the cons this, uh, all, sorry, the all men kind of goodwill is Muslim. All men are members of this all embracing one deen, which is called Islam. The construction of the anonymous Christian is therefore quite <coughs> parallel to this. Um, you can be a Muslim without really being aware of it. Now, Shahru doesn't speak of the anonymous Muslim. <coughs> he could, but he doesn't. The reasoning behind both concepts is similar. And I come back to what I said a minute ago. Christians usually limit paradise to Christians only. All others will have to go to hell. In the same way, most Muslims confine paradise to their own religion, while all, all others are condemned to hell. That's what Mahmoud Sharur expounds. And Shahrur reads the Quranic text in a different way. In reality, all people of goodwill who follow their natural universal religion, universal religion, which is Islam, have to be called Muslims and therefore can enter paradise. What people call Islam today should be, according to Shahrur's understanding of the text, be called Iman. The pillars of Islam should be called the pillars of Iman. And the, the man who is, you know, in our usual, usual terminology, a Muslim, should be called a Mu'min. And he has some interesting, uh, you know, arguments for this. I will not go into this in, to, to, in, to any depth. He says the Omar, al -Ibn, Omar ibn al Khattab was called Amir al Mu'minin and not, uh, not, not, was not called uh, uh, Amir al Muslimin. And the Ummahat, the wives of the Prophet, were called Ummahat al Mu'minin and not Ummahat al Muslimin. Um, he does, Shahru does admit that in some places the word Mu'min must mean only the follower of the Prophet Muhammad. But I, I will not go into any depth. Shahru's method was criticized by many, and the best known among them may be Nasser Hamid Abu Zaid. And Shahru can, uh, whatever the critics said, serve as an example, as one of a new Muslim uh, layer of intellectuals in the public sphere who have led at least to a collapse of earlier hierarchical notions of religious authority based on claims to the mastery of a fixed body, uh, fixed bodies of religious text. Uh, Muhammad Shahru is a, an engineer by training. The, the, the point, the third point, for, um, last but one, um, the recognition on, from the Christian side that Muhammad is a prophet. Now Hans Kung, Hans Kung who uh, cannot be said to speak for the Catholic Church, but he's a very important Catholic theologian, I quote, said, if the Catholic Church, after the declaration of the non-Christian religions in Vatican II, also sees the Muslims, and this is a quote, with great respect, who pray to the one and only God, who spoke to mankind, end of quote, then the same church and all Christian churches should see the one person with great respect, whose name is not mentioned in that declaration, out of embarrassment, also he and he alone led the Muslims to worship this one God, and also God spoke through him, Muhammad the prophet. Um, well, we all know that Hans Küng does not represent Catholic theology. I find him yeah, I know, <laughs> but it's difficult to contradict him. And lastly, the concept of Muslims as an Ummah Wasat. 
this is now the sort of the top, the, the, the top of inclusivism is reached when some modern Muslim exegetes interpret Quranic verses, verses such as 2, 143, I, I will not quote, and 566, that describe Muslims as constituting a middle moderate community, Ummah Wasat, and righteous Jews and Christians as a balanced moderate community, Ummah Muqtasida. Taken together, that's a quote, these verses clearly suggest that it is subscription to some common standard of righteousness and ethical conduct that determines the salvific nature of religious community and not the denominational label it chooses to wear. This is Asma Afsaruddin, teaches at um, I think the University of Indiana. The Indonesian scholar Nuhalish Majid teaches in his tafsir of Quran 262 and of other verses that all non-Muslims who believe in God should be recommenced by paradise. Not only Jews, Christians and Sabians, but also Hindus, Buddhists and adherents of other religions. That comes close to Mohammed Shahru's position. Um, the South African Muslim Farid uh, Ishaq Ezak is determined, I quote, to find the space in my own theology for those who are not Muslim, yet are deeply committed to seeing the grace and compassion of an all-loving creator expressed in the righteous and caring words of ordinary men and women. He also criticizes some Muslim movements as, I quote, anti-everyone other than ourselves. <coughs> now let me close this paper um, with three statements, predictions, I'm not sure. In multi-religious societies, individual conversion and individual apostasy, two sides of the coin, will become more frequent. Second, in multi-religious societies, religious-minded people have to coexist and to cooperate, not only with each other, but also with secularists, agnostics, and atheists. I think that's clear to see. And my last point, New approaches of Muslims toward their own religion and toward the religions of others mainly come from Islam in the periphery, like Indonesia, India, Malaysia, or from the Muslim diaspora. They will probably not come from Cairo, I'm not sure about Rabat, let alone from Mecca and Medina. The person in whose honor we have assembled here and the institution which hosts us both seem to confirm at least this last point. Thank you very much. Well, the uh, timing is flawless, actually. Uh, so I think we would have uh, some time uh, for questions, and I'll try to keep uh, the clock on that so that we can uh, move on to our second presentation. But I think we have a, a great deal that uh, people might wish to discuss, uh, and so if there is a, just a question or a query. Uh, I would like to inquire of him about something. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. um, now, you mentioned many. Too many men. On, uh, on the side of Christianity as well as on the side of Islam who claim superiority for their religion. <coughs> now, I would like to believe that these are reasonable people. At least they meet the minimum requirement of rationality. Doesn't, any, doesn't it occur to any of them that they are writing to say this is a double-edged sword argument. So I, if I claim superiority for my religion, what ground am I doing? That my religion was revealed but theirs wasn't? But the other can make the same claim. Doesn't it occur to any of these people who meet the minimum requirements of rationality? They don't have to be above the minimum. Doesn't it occur to any one of them to say, you know, this is a double-edged sword argument. If I can make that claim, <coughs> he can equally make that claim. The other can equally make that claim. And so here we need independent reasons for saying that mine is superior. But, I mean, if, if your reason is merely your 
faith that this was revealed, but the religion of the other wasn't. But the other can make the same claim. Does, I mean, doesn't it occur to any of them? And another, <laughs> another, another yeah. simple remark. Muhammad Abd said that the crucifixion was a paradigm of unreasonableness. Is that you no, got I, it? I didn't say this. I, I, oh. He may have claimed it, but I didn't say that. Yeah. If the crucifixion. Yeah, yes, the, yes, <laughs> yeah, yes, yes. If the Christ, crucifixion. Christ, that's on the cross. Yeah, right. If the crucifixion was unreasonable. Then the story of the Quran is reasonable. Yeah. That God made <laughs> yes. the replica yeah. <laughs> that was the first act of cloning in history. <laughs> yeah. I mean, did it occur to him to say, you know, the crucifixion is a historical event. Yeah. You know, it could be true. Yeah. But the other story, the other story is the paradigm of a reasonable. <laughs> Did it occur to him? No. Well, why, don't we, uh, why don't we let uh, Professor Vild yeah. uh, respond? Well, of course, I don't know what Muhammad Abdu <laughs> thought. <laughs> I, I, I like to, to answer you, I like to quote Rana because I think it's exactly, you have hit a very important point. Um, Rana wrote when he developed this very sort of inclusivist theory, of which, was, which looks very inclusive, of the anonymous Christian, he said, um, um, let us say a Buddhist monk, because he follows his conscience, attains salvation and lives in the grace of God. Of him I must say that he is an anonymous Christian. If not, I would have to presuppose that there is a genuine path to salvation that really attains that goal, but that simply has nothing to do with Jesus Christ. This is the sort of rock bottom. He cannot, he cannot overcome the theological last sort of resort. And that is why he has to construct this idea of an enormous Christian. And I think um, this is uh, theology, Christian theology, Muslim theology, often runs into these things that um, um, an example which comes to my mind is what happens in Christian theology to, uh, to child babies who have not been baptized and yeah, die. Right. Yeah. So they said it's inconceivable that God condemns them to hell. It's also inconceivable that they really are, yes, they are not, they are not, uh, they, they know nothing about Christ, so they can't be on the same level. So they constructed purgatory, heaven, and paradise, a fourth uh, theological locus where these uh, children were, the limbo. This is the way theology works. And um, uh, I think um, as long as the, uh, as the exclusive truth, only uh, religions adhere to the, to the concept of an exclusive truth, which in some way they have, we will have to, uh, to accept that. Religions are built that way. Maybe in a thousand years they will be different. But as for now, um, we, we come to these rock bottom things where theology says now that is the bottom and of course this bottom changes it's not uh, something which is uh, you know uh, which is unchangeable but it changes slowly uh, and what Mohammed Abdo really thought I don't maybe you know much well, okay. <laughs> well, yeah, I, I think we are going to I'm, 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 I'm on the list <laughs> the next one I'll, t I'll tell you what I think Mohammed Abdo really thought but before that I'd just like to to respond to your to the first point you read um, I think I think that this is the central problem and uh, part of the central problem is that the world looks differently to a believer and to a philosopher for a philosopher, it's a double-edged weapon. To a believer, it may be a double-edged weapon, but I am holding the hilt of this double-edged weapon. And the difference is that, you know, the other person might say that they have a superior truth claim. They might say all sorts of nonsense, right? But the fact is that they don't. Yeah? Now, I mean, I think, I think that for Muhammad Abdul, um, he... He, he was following in a long European tradition in seeing the crucifixion as ridiculous. And um, I, I, don't, I've, I haven't really been able to find out as much as this about this as I would like to, but he was in contact with this tradition 
quite possibly. Um, because when he was in Paris, there's a report of him uh, being found with some members of the Theosophical Society. And one can trace the Theosophical Society back to Deism and the whole concept of the rational religion. Now, if you, if you have got this concept of the rational religion, then uh, a lot of Christianity is highly problematic. Um, and it, it's, it, Islam is much easier to fit with this concept of the rational religion. So that's my guess uh, about what Muhammad Abdul actually thought. Let's see, I'm, the, uh, yes, I think. And then, please, go ahead. I, I would also like to <coughs> respond to the uh, comment that was made earlier. I think there are two strategies that are adopted by people who claim superiority, um, which perhaps um, respond to the query that was raised. It's often not simply that my religion is revealed, your is not, but they actually create an independent criteria, and I deliberately use the word create, and then try to show that their religion meets that criteria better than the other religion. So for example, <coughs> in the current economic crisis, many Muslims have written that Islamic economics would have allowed world not to go into it. So they look at economic system, do not compare it with Christianity, but the economic system and say the economic system based on their religion or superior would have responded to the issue. Another strategy is science, to take science as an independent criteria and then argue that their religion and their book is more scientific than the other book. So often it's not just between the two religions, but in a way to convince the followers of their own religion, the creators and uh, what one could uh, call an independent criteria and try to respond to it. The second thing is that I think this kind of discourse has a function. What it does is in a way helps reinterpret the religion to respond to contemporary challenges. So when Muhammad Abdu is trying to argue and he says at one point that uh, religion is a friend of science, in a way he is reinterpreting the tradition to make it acceptable to the younger generation of his time. And that's where the power, I think, of this discourse comes, that it helps this psychological uh, it gives the psychological comfort that they are both following the tradition as well as living in modern times. Um, and uh, but that perhaps is why it survives. Would you, uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, may, uh, uh, well it's what I would like to say comes uh, well close to what Farid is mentioning, but from another angle. It's uh, something that we, we we mentioned this morning about the, its translatability, because you made you gave us a list of, of terms, and for which you said there were equivalents in the other tradition, Petra, and I have never heard of the Christian. Anonymous Christian. Christian. <laughs> yes, and so so here yeah, <coughs> again, uh, I think we are facing a dilemma: either we reject translation totally, and then we are forced into taking each tradition as a kind of island to totally isolated from the others, completely we are in full, fully in culturalism. We going for translatability and uh, finding equivalence, uh, surely that those terms have some family resemblance, if I can say. There is something common there, but it's not exactly. Feta uh, is so complex and so on. So here, uh, I think we are facing, and maybe one way of getting, of facing this dilemma is not to ask whether we should go for translation or not, is to look at what, what was the exercise, what was, what people were wanting to do through this exercise, what Muhammad Abdu was wanting to do through saying that uh, religion and science are, are friends or are close to each other. He wanted to convince his people, his fellow Muslims and so on, that science is not something to, to be seen as, as a foreign and to be rejected and so on. So uh, here, well, I was interested by this list of, uh, of this dictionary or beginning of a, of a dictionary of terms. It may be a good exercise to, uh, to, to maybe to look after or to, 
to inquire into the peculiarities of each concept by making it a kind of a counterpart of trying to find counterparts in other traditions. But there are, uh, I think there are serious obstacles there if we want to push things too much, unless we settle down for what uh, would be a Wittgenstein exercise to see what language game is, is going on there. Yeah. Well, I, I agree that it's extremely dangerous to you know, just juxtapose. Uh, I agree completely. Um, and that's why in, in, my la in my last sentence I said uh, my hope for you know, changes in the paradigm rests mainly on the diaspora. Because they are Muslims and non-Muslims, Christians in, in their various ways, are forced to come to terms with certain developments which maybe Muslims in, in other situations do not have to face. And that's there must be solution. The, 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 you know, some of you may have heard of the fiqh al aqaliyat mm -hmm. which is a new, a fairly new phenomenon, fiqh, being adjusted to new situations. Um, uh, so, uh, I think, and that's one of the points where I disagree with, uh, with our teacher, that I think this is mainly a Muslim obligation. It cannot be done by non-Muslim. You, I, well, I know you will contribute. <laughs> but on the other hand, if you if you if you read um, the face of Tafrika of Al Ghazali, where he says that somebody who has heard of the Prophet Muhammad in in the room in the territory of the room, and um, uh, he has heard that he's a very bad man, and uh, you know you cannot expect him to accept the, uh, the his message. So that comes fairly close to what Rana says. I think it, uh, it, you know, whatever it is called, it's a, it's a very, I think, a nice sort of comparison, which is, uh, I think, legitimate. Uh, uh, if, uh, well, let's see. I think we, I, I want to move us on uh, pretty quickly, and I think a, a moment, but we must give uh, uh, Professor Arkun a chance to say something as well. You, oh, sorry. Yeah. If you can. Yeah. No, I just had a question. Do you do you see this as a specifically theological issue? Because um, you know, for instance, we tend to say in modern times that there is you know, democracy is superior to all other forms of government. You know, forgetting the Churchillian quip. Um, and then there is a move to say that there are forms of democracy which are more suited to particular cultures, although not ideal in the, in the sense that you know, the, the Western democracy has reached, uh, but one must make some allowance for these local variations. And one may perhaps in a little bit of uh, uh, violence uh, see this uh, Mumin uh, Iman Islam dichotomy or, or uh, continuum yeah. that uh, Sharu um, uses in, let's say, in uh, China, where they say there is a there is democracy in general, but then there is the Chinese Bruxelles. style of democracy, which is uh, more or less like a Sharu's Iman, uh, as opposed to. I mean, I'm I'm being only slightly. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's half jocular about it, but. There is the, the, the question is: Is this specifically a religious issue? Uh, uh, is this specifically a religious phenomenon, rather, to think in these terms? I'm not sure I understand you. I mean, in in Shahru's term, it's of course it's religious. No, no, no. I mean, you, you you have presented this yeah, uh, yeah. as, as uh, something that happens within theology. Yeah. But my question is: that Is it? peculiarly theological or is it a more general phenomenon and where is it best analyzed? Is it analyzed in the study of theology or is it better analyzed in a, a wider framework? Yeah. That's my question. Yeah. Well, I'm not sure whether I can really answer that. I, I only can say it is uh, portrayed as something which crops up in exegesis of the Quran. So in that sense, it's tafsir. And in that sense, it's theology. That there are automatisms involved, which may, you know, be present in other, you know, layers of society or of history. I, I don't contest that. But it's as it as it stands there. It's a book on Islam. Where it's yeah, yeah. my question simply was about the categories of analysis that we, 
uh, uh, best yeah. Yeah. views, not, yeah. not the phenomenon. Yeah, yes. Anyway, uh, 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 Professor Arkun. I think Just Professor Arkun, yes. You, uh, yes. Let uh, you, but you conclude, and then we'll move on to our next one. <laughs> yes, uh, there is uh, all this discussion and also the paper. Uh, it seems to me that, that they are based on a postulate that we are unable still to assume intellectually. The postulate that all these actors who have their theory, their position, etc., the Pope, uh, Abdu, and uh, we postulate that they are using reason and that this reason is in every discourse, whether it is religion, religious, whether it is historical, whether it is theological. And this postulate, it doesn't work. We cannot work with such a postulate. And even in our discussion, we admit that postulate, that they are all speaking in the name of reason, which is not true. There is a discourse built on the imaginary. Imaginary in English doesn't work. Imaginaire. Imaginaire. L'imaginaire social. L'imaginaire religieux. It preempts what we call reason. Because everyone comes and makes a statement, we receive it as the statement in the name of reason. A respectable, reliable reason. Which is, which is not the truth. I mean, it's not the reality. The psychological reality. We have emotions. Not only imagine, imaginary works on the side of emotion. It doesn't work on the side of the rational. So this went through century, centuries. As you say, Benoit, Benoit says he's our contemporary. He made this lecture in our time, and he is he's supposed to be aware about the, the vicissitudes, the doctrinal vicissitudes in which reason expresses itself. So it is very difficult to identify the role, the real role of what we call reason, because there are many vicissitudes, many circumstances which make reason in a status which is much down to the role, the real role which is played by the imaginaire and which is played with, with the emotions. In our time, the majority of discourses, even in, in the West, are dominated by emotion. We have a book just published recently in France uh, by uh, Dominique Moisy. It is called The Geopolitics of Emotion. Yeah, well, great concept. Because it delivers us from the postulate that we are all speaking in the, name, uh, in the name of reason. And that reason is autonomous, is free. It is dominating. It, uh, uh, it tells to uh, imagine, uh, shut up, it's, uh, it's me who, uh, who have the floor, always. This is not true. I mean true in terms of what is done, what we do really, even among the, in, our, in, our, in our group. The other side, the, the other thing is that, uh, as you know, I insist since many years now on two couples of concepts, the thinkable and the unthinkable. This is one couple. And the unthought of and the thought of. There is a strong dialectic between, in, inside these two couples. It is. They, they are first sociological concepts before being philosophical intellectual oppositions. Because reason precisely is <coughs> working in the frame of changing epistemes. Uh, this is also a concept that we have to respect when we speak about the activities of reason. The activities of reason of people you spoke this morning in the first 300 years of, 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 of Hijra for Muslims has nothing to do with our epistemic today. 
has things to do. And the episteme of the activities of reason in contemporary Muslim societies, I cannot divide it because it's so so mixed, so out of any kind of reference, any kind of criteria, that I cannot identify it any kind of reason. But I can identify the role, the dominating role, and the alienating role for reason. Reason is alienated totally of emotions. People are living under the pressure of emotions. And this uh, Moisey has uh, spoken very well about precisely what's happening in Muslim societies, especially since 9-11. So we have to be careful about treating all these statements just from the side of reason, that reason is, 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 is present there. When uh, Shaharor stated what is, it is out of reason. I don't know where he can take this uh, Muslim, etc. It's uh, really, uh, I cannot locate it. I, it, it is not uh, emotional, it is not, uh, 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 how can I say, critical reason, it has nothing to do. It is not analysis of language, nothing. I don't know, just a statement like this. So, you, you see, it's extremely complicated because we are neglecting things. The unthought of, we had an example with legitimacy in, in Islamic thought. And uh, so many other concepts, even state, we, we say dawla. Dawla is a cycle. Uh, uh, the same circumstances always come, uh, come again back. It's not the state of things. They are there, we observe it. So if we cannot, we cannot think about, with the word dollar, we cannot think about the state. And nevertheless, we are reporting what Muslims are saying about dollar until now. So the, the unthinkable is linked to each episteme as a frame existing and commanding the way reason operates in each phase of history, in 18th century in Europe, it's totally changed. All the episteme, traditional episteme, is broken down. So there is another reason, an emerging one. It doesn't mean that all reason now is liberated from the ancient episteme. So uh, theological uh, reason, it is more on the side of Affectivity, sensitivity, what, what my belief imposes on me, then on any, on, on any kind of reason that we would use as an instance that will help us to identify that I am operating with emotions and not with, uh, not with reason, etc., etc. And the, 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 the field, the sociological field, the, 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 the cultural field, of operating in the Muslim, in, in the Muslim uh, thinking now is totally out of any reference neither to modern reason nor to classical reason, Islamic reason as it was uh, operating with people like Hassali, like uh, 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 for example in the, in the discussion between Hassali and, and other West. Two different reasons. Because the epistemes are totally different, etc. So, uh, and we would not pay enough attention to the field of the unthinkable. I cannot think about it. today in the way Muslims are talking. I would say, not thinking. They are talking. They are delivering discourses yeah, because they are not aware. I'm going to, um, I should give you a chance to respond, but I'm not going to. Uh, <laughs> this is